Hey everybody, Joe Rignola here, and as you can see behind me, I've got what looks like a really complicated diagram, but I'm gonna do my best to try and break this thing down for you. Um, what this is, is a process um, from when you have something like a bagel with gluten in it, all the way through your digestive tract and into your immune system. I get asked this question a lot, um, and I, I explain this to my, my clients uh, all the time. How is it that gluten can affect you know, virtually every tissue in my body? And so this is the process that goes on. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. So the, the first thing, let me describe the, the landscape of the gut a little bit. And the first thing you have to understand is that the inside of your digestive tract is actually the outside of your body. I know that doesn't sound right, it sounds a little counterintuitive, uh, but think of your digestive tract, um, looking at this bagel here as, as an example, the whole of the bagel, the center of the bagel is at the inside or the outside of the bagel. Well, of course, it's the outside of the bagel. The inside of the bagel is the actual inside of the bagel. So it's the same thing with your digestive tract. Um, it's, it's really the outside of your body and you don't want things that belong outside your body to be inside your body. Um, so we're going to travel right down to the small intestine and we're going to zoom up uh, on one little small, uh, portion of the small intestine and we're going to find these finger-like proje pro projections um, or like a shed carpeting. And if you saw uh, in my three-part video series, uh, my free three-part video series where I talk about uh, the mistakes people make when they go gluten-free, I talk about these villi a little bit. And these villi create a tremendous amount of surface area which allows you to absorb nutrients. Now the surface area is so great if you were to flatten this small intestine out, flatten all these villi out, the, the surface area is great enough that you could cover a tennis court. Um, and that, again, that allows you to absorb nutrients. Without that surface area, um, you are, struggle to absorb nutrients. And that's one of the main problems with celiac disease is that these villi are, are gone. And you have you know, almost no surface area there. So that's the villi. Now we're gonna blow up just one small section of this villi really big and we're gonna find this single layer of cells. These cells are called epithelial cells and it's a single layer of cells. It's um, in your mucosal barrier and the job of this mucosal barrier is to absorb nutrients, very small single particle nutrients um, uh, that your body can use to build muscle and, and, and nourish itself. Um, but it all, its other job is to keep anything else out. So undigested food and proteins and bacteria and other antigens, pathogens, fungus, all that stuff is supposed to stay outside of the body. In between each of these cells is something called tight junctions. And it's a structure that acts sort of, uh, sort of like a doorway. Normal function is, uh, let's take car complex carbohydrates are broken down into simple sugars. And those simple sugars are allowed to pass through. Anything else isn't. Uh, proteins uh, are broken down into single amino acids, and those amino acids uh, should be allowed to pass through, and you know, undigested proteins aren't. Um, so that's the, a basic landscape, a basic overview of what the digestive tract is supposed to look like. Let's start with what happens when you take a bite of something like a bagel. First of all, why would you do that? But uh, nevertheless, you indulge in, in a bagel, and you chew it for a while, and one of the first things that happens actually is it starts to break down in your mouth into simple sugars. Now, you think you're being healthy, you have a whole wheat bale, and you're like, ah, you know, it's whole wheat, it's whole grain, I can, you know, I'm supposed to eat this stuff. Well, turns out you're really not. And that so-called complex carbohydrate isn't so complex. You have an enzyme in your mouth called amylase, which does a pretty darn good job of breaking that so-called complex carbohydrate into simple sugars. So uh, if you were to chew on that bite of, uh, of bagel or bread or something like that for a long enough period of time, it would actually start to taste sweet. And that's because that complex carbohydrate is turning into simple sugars that quickly. And so taking a bite of a bagel is really the same as just having a big old scoop of sugar. So we're gonna travel right through into the small intestine and talk about what happens next. So, Obviously, you took a bite of a bagel and you've gotten exposed to a tremendous amount of gluten with that. Um, and gluten can be broken down into something called gliadin. Now, it can be broken down into a lot of things. There's uh, about 100 different, uh, you know, subproteins, we'll call it, uh, that we know of. And any number of those could cause, you know, similar problems. But the one that we're going to focus on, because it's the one that's 
typically looked at is something called alpha glidin. Glidin is now in that, uh, the lumen of the intestine, which is the inside of the intestine, again, outside the body, and it doesn't belong inside the body. Now, the interesting thing about glidin is that it is resistant to human digestion. It's resistant to human digestion. It's not resistant to human digestion with people with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. It's resistant to human digestion. We can't digest this stuff. All right, so what this undigested protein is gonna do, it's gonna interact with a receptor on the cell, and that receptor is called CXCR3. So what that CXCR3 receptor is going to do is it's going to send a, a signal down into the cell and cause it to produce another protein called zonulin. Now zonulin is a protein that regulates the permeability of these tight junctions. Okay, so now you've got all this zonulin floating around the small intestine, and what zonulin is gonna do, it's gonna interact with some other receptors in the gut, and it's gonna start to cause the degradation of those tight junctions. It's gonna open up the doorway between the outside and the inside. Why is it, why would it do that? I mean, this, what this really is, is a last resort. Your body sees gliding as such a threat that it's going to expose that antigen, gliadin, to your immune system for your immune system to take care of. Now, we know this because the, the other way that this happens is when the small intestine is exposed to bacteria. Now, bacteria is really supposed to be in the large intestine, but sometimes you can get uh, some bacteria that backs up into the small intestine, and that's something called small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and your body responds to that the same way. Now that bacteria is a, a huge threat to your small intestine because it's gonna compete to absorb nutrients and cause some inflammation and cause all kinds of problems. So what this does, it, the, the body, uh, the small intestine, the mucosal barrier uh, senses this bacteria and it releases zonulin and it opens up these tight junctions and that's, that allows fluid to come into the small intestine to try and flush some of that bacteria down but it's also gonna expose it to the immune system so the immune system can deal with it as well. That's again, this is a last resort. The body sees that bacteria as such a threat that it needs to take care of it this way. It's seeing gliadin as that same threat. Again, this is not celiac disease or, or, or strictly for celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. This is everyone. Anyone who eats gluten, it gets broken down into gliadin and causes intestinal permeability, also known as leaky gut. Now, for, for people without celiac disease or gluten sensitivity, your, your gut's going to heal you know, as, as quickly as 20 minutes or so. The gut could heal, depending on how strong your gut is. Now, people with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity, these receptors, these CXCR3 receptors, are overactive. And so you're going to get a bunch of these receptors coming up out of the cells and that's going to uh, cause the upregulation of zonulin and it's going to cause the degradation of these these doorways these tight junctions and it's going to allow that gliadin molecule that gliadin protein to get through and into the bloodstream what else can get into the bloodstream well if there's bacteria in there that bacteria is going to get into the bloodstream um, the, you can get some fungus that ends up into the bloodstream um, you can get something called uh, lipopolysaccharides, which is really like a waste product of bacteria, and that can get into the bloodstream. That causes a tremendous immune response and, and, and inflammatory response. Um, so that's what happens when you have this, this, uh, this intestinal permeability. You're really exposing the outside world to the inside world, and that's not a good thing. Okay, so what happens next? Now that this gliadin protein is past the mucosal barrier and into the really into the into the body into the bloodstream. The immune system has to get involved here. So in order for that to happen, um, an enzyme has to interact with this gliadin protein, and that enzyme is called tissue transglutaminase or TTG. That tissue transglutaminase comes from your body's own cells, and that's important. Uh, and I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so what that tissue transglutaminase is doing is it's doing something called deamidation. It's deamidating 
that gliadin protein, which is really allowing it to be bound to human cells. Now, the human cell we're talking about first is something called a dendritic cell. This is the first stop along this immune response. Um, and it, just as a side note, I'm explaining this in sort of like this step-by-step -step linear fashion. This happens so fast um, that it, in some cases it's, it kind of happens at the same time. Uh, but for the sake of the video, I'm just kind of explaining it in this sort of step-by-step -step linear fashion so it's easier to understand. Um, so this tissue transglutaminase uh, allows that gliadin protein to attach to this immune cell known as a dendritic cell. This dendritic cell is going to turn into something called an antigen-presenting cell. So on the surface of this cell, this antigen-presenting cell, which is a white blood cell, you've got this protein structure. This protein structure is called a cumin leukocyte antigen, or HLA. This protein structure, its job is to present the antigen along the next to the, to the next step in the immune system, which is the T cell. This, comp, this, this immune complex is not just the gliadin. Unfortunately, it also includes the tissue transglutaminase. Why is that unfortunate? Because tissue transglutaminase is you. It's what's known as the autoantigen. So that, that, uh, that HLA could be, the gene expression for that could be DQ2, it could be DQ5, it could be DQ9. The two, uh, the two gene types that are associated strongly with celiac disease are DQ2 or DQ8. Uh, and about 97, 98% of celiac disease patients have one or both of those. And it depends on, on your parents. You're going to get one from your mom and one from your dad. So this protein structure, if it's DQ2 or DQ8, and there are others that are associated uh, with it except, uh, except for DQ4, which doesn't appear to have any association with celiac disease, but the others do. However, 97, 98% of people with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity have either DQ2 and or DQ8. Okay, so... What that's going to do, it's going to present this immune complex to the T cell, which is the next stop on the journey. Now, what this is like is, let's say you and a friend are walking down the street and you witness a mugging. Now, your friend says, I got to stop that. And he goes and he grabs the mugger. And he tries to knock the mugger out so the police can come and apprehend the, the mugger. So the T cells, T cells are kind of like the cops. At the same time, your, your buddy goes over and tries to apprehend the mugger, tries to, tries to beat him up. You're like, I gotta take a picture of this. I gotta take some video of this. And it's, you, so you start shooting video on this and you're thinking, this is gonna be great because I'm gonna be able to show the video to the cops. The cops are gonna be able to identify the mugger and they're gonna be able to go and arrest him. So you take video, you show it to the cops and the cops say, great, we've got a really good description of the mugger and we've got a really good description of this other guy who's you know, associated with the mugger. So we're gonna go after both of them. You're like, oh well, no, wait a minute, there was just one mugger. That, that other dude is, is my friend, he was trying to help. The cops are like, I don't care, it's, he's in the video, he's associated with the mugger, we're gonna go after him too. That's what's happening here. So you're showing this video, this, this HLA, this DQ2 or DQ8, showing, showing the video or photo to the cops. It's seeing the gliadin, which is the actual antigen, but it's also seeing this tissue transglutaminase, so it's guilty by association. The T cells are now going to go after both. They're going to go after the gliadin, which is the antigen that doesn't belong in your bloodstream, but it's also going to go after you because you are tissue transglutaminase. Make sense? So here's what the T cells are going to do. T cells are going to uh, create something called killer T cells. And those killer T cells are going to go to the scene of the crime where the gliadin entered the bloodstream, and they're going to attack everything that looks like gliadin, but they're also going to attack the cells that produce tissue transglutaminase. And they're gonna keep attacking these cells as long as you, to, as you expose yourself to gluten. Because this process is gonna keep going on as long as you are eating bagels. So the other thing that's gonna happen is there's gonna be a different type of T cell called a helper T cell that's created and that's gonna to talk to the B cells. And B cells are gonna create two different types of B cells. Um, now, the B cells have the same information that the T cells have, which is there's this mugger, this immune complex, gliadin and tissue transglutaminase, and you need to 
create an army to neutralize that antigen. And so it does. It creates something called memory B cells. And these guys are going to hang out and, and be ready if there's ever another exposure to it. Or as long as this exposure is going on, these guys are going to help attack that, that antigen. This is like when you get a vaccine for something like malaria, and then a year later you go to Africa and get bit by a mosquito. You've got the, you've got the, the, the antibodies to malaria uh, to help protect you from that disease. Um, so any sort of vaccine. So you've basically given yourself a vaccination to gliadin and tissue transglutaminase. The other type of B cell is going to be an antibody producing cell and these B cells are going to also go to the scene of the crime. They're going to show up to where the, that's a terrible arrow, they're going to show up to where the gliadin entered the bloodstream and these antigen producing cells, just like it sounds, they produce, uh, these antibody producing cells are producing antibodies and again they're going to continue to attack the gliadin they're going to continue to attack these cells because those cells are producing tissue transglutaminase and they're going to continue to attack and attack and cause inflammation and sooner or later these villi where we discussed how important those were are going to start to get blunted and they're going to get worn down and that's going to decrease the surface area and that's going to cause you to not be able to absorb nutrients. That's the process. But I'm going to take this a step further. What happens now that your immune system is all, you know, geared up to fight not only gliadin, but tissue transglutaminase? Here's the kicker, is that tissue transglutaminase isn't just in these cells in your gut. They're everywhere in your body. They're literally produced by every tissue in your body. So the immune system, while the immune system's out, it's like guilty by association. We're going to attack tissue transglutaminase. Um, there's tissue transglutaminase in your thyroid, and there's tissue transglutaminase in your liver, in your pancreas, and so your your immune system is going to say, "Hey, wait a minute, that's the bad guy. We better attack the thyroid because it's got tissue transglutaminase in it. We better attack the liver. We better attack uh, joints, the joint tissue, muscle, your brain." literally anywhere in your body. So when it attacks the, the thyroid, that starts to look like Hashimoto's, which is a, a hypothyroid auto, autoimmune disease. And so any sort of autoimmune disease, you have to consider gluten as one of the possible triggers. According to research by Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's one of the leading, if not the leading researcher on gluten sensitivity and celiac disease in the world, there's three ingredients to autoimmune disease. One is that you have to have a genetic predisposition. Again, we talked about that HLA, that human leukocyte antigen, this protein structure on the surface of the white blood cell, this antigen presenting cell, either DQ2 or DQ8, which is your genetic predisposition. The next ingredient is that it's got to have a trigger. That trigger is gliadin or gluten. That's the trigger. The third ingredient is that there has to be a way for gliadin to get to the immune system and that is this intestinal permeability. So those are the, th the three ingredients that are required for autoimmune disease. Whew. Okay, <laughs> leave me a comment. Let me know if all of that made sense. I tried to break it down as quickly as possible, but also make it as <laughs> easily understood as possible. Let me know if you have any questions. If you didn't get in on the, the three part video series where I talk about the, the three big mistakes that people make when starting a gluten-free diet, there's a link below. Um, and you can, you can get in on that. Uh, again, it's a completely free three-part video series and um, it's just packed with information and, and, and stuff that will hopefully serve you and help you uh, improve your health. Um, that's it. Thanks everybody for watching. I'm Joe and I look forward to helping you achieve your greatest health.